А вот. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Fit Pet Boston Talks. My name is Leah Lodato, and I am the host of the show. I just wanted to take a minute and thank you so much for tuning in and spending the next few moments with me. Normally, my spouse, Laurie, and I get together and we talk on this podcast about different dog uh, training topics or activities. She's not with me today. Today, I'm going to be doing a book review. So I recently read the book, How Dogs Work by Raymond Coppinger and Mark Feinstein. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the topics that were covered in this book and recommend the book if you're interested in learning more about dog behavior. So before I get started, again, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're into what you're hearing, if you're connecting with what we talk about on the podcast, please feel free to like and subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. It helps more people listen to the show. And we try our very best to get episodes out on Friday. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes not. It really depends on our schedule and how busy we are during the week. Okay, so First of all, I just wanted to give a disclaimer that I am not some sort of heady intellectual that just reads in all my spare time. <laughs> I'm a very normal person. I enjoy reading. I don't read very much scientific literature. I find it to be extremely difficult to get through. So most of my reading for fun is, you know, plot-driven stories. I do read, I love historical fiction, and I love historical nonfiction too, but you know, again, I don't typically sit down and read textbook style books about dogs and candidates and stuff like that, because it's actually quite hard for me to get through that material. And when I do these book reviews for the podcast, it's not easy for me, I have to go through and really think about what I want to say, try to pull out topics from the book to encourage people to read the book without giving too much of the content of the book away. I personally believe that knowledge is power. And if you want it, you got to go out and get it. So what my goal is, is to present the topics that were covered in the book, go into one or two of them, and then encourage you if you're interested to read the book. And I don't read any books about dogs unless they become recommended to me. So when I first started working with dogs, I read a bunch of different books and a lot of them were just crap. So a lot of self-published books, which would kind of be along the lines of a blog post that the author decided to spend a bunch of money and get written copies of a book made. A lot of books that were not very well researched so if you're reading something scientific or historical, there usually is some sort of bibliography or reference at the end of that book, and it's going to show you how the author came to the conclusions that they came to based on the evidence that they read elsewhere. And a lot of the books that I read in the beginning were just opining. So they're just opinions about the best ways to train dogs or the best way to walk dogs and all of this other stuff. And kind of knowing from a bird's eye view that, okay, there's a lot of stuff out there that's like not so great. It makes me a little apprehensive to read books about dogs or canids. So this particular book came recommended to me during a seminar that I attended, and that's why I made the decision to read it. <laughs> so I'll just talk a little bit about that seminar. So I attended the Canine Brain Lab seminar, which was held at the Michael Ellis School for Dogs back in July. It was taught by Paul Deschamps and Dr. Melanie Oud, and I am lucky enough to know Paul personally, so I've done a few private lessons with him. He helped me out a lot with my dog, Raven. We were working on just teaching some concepts when she was basically a puppy. And I've attended a few of his seminars when he has had them locally. And I really love the way that Paul interacts with dogs. He's a good teacher. He's a really smart guy. And when this seminar popped up, I was like, you know what? I really should take the weekend and take this seminar. So I listened to it. I watched it. It was really well produced. And they produced a recording for afterwards so that I could kind of brush up on any parts that I missed or I wasn't completely paying attention to. And for the money, I thought that it was a really great learning experience. During the course of the seminar, Paul mentioned this book, How Dogs Work. And I thought to myself, hey, if Paul 
recommends this, I'm going to read it. That's how I operate. So I did. Checked it out from my local library. And spoiler alert, I would recommend this book if you work with dogs or even if you're an enthusiastic pet owner. So to get into the a few of the topics of the book, first of all, I'm not going to cover, I'm not going to s- deeply summarize this book text okay so I'm just going to introduce some of the topics that the book covers and a few details that I found interesting and just leave it at that so a lot of the concepts I was familiar with from reading books like Temple Grandin's Animals Make Us Human um, the beginning parts of this text again I was kind of familiar with the concepts which was nice because it just reinforced some things that I already know Animals Make Us Human comes recommended from a lot of dog professionals, whether you're a trainer or a behaviorist, it's a great book. It's a really thick, heady read. And most of the time, you know, people will recommend getting through the first couple of chapters of that book because it talks about dogs and their emotions and the blue ribbon emotions and and such. It is a book that I've listened to and read bits and pieces of it as well. But it's one of those that's stationary on the bookshelf that, you know, I have to reference over the years in order to really grasp all the concepts in there. This book, How Dogs Work, is a shorter read. And to me, I think that the authors make a really great connection between conceptualizing our dogs as purely pets and making the argument for the complexity of their biologic species and how they are animals at the end of the day. And I think that the length of the book reflects the author's willingness to break down the concepts so that pet dog owners can access this material. I do believe that that was part of the way that the book was written. Because these concepts could go on and on, Obviously, these authors are brilliant individuals, yet the book is 200 pages long. So that tells me they want normal, regular people to be able to read this book. And I think that if you are a normal, regular person, you'll be able to read this book because I was able to read it within the course of a couple of weeks. You know, and I know that that sounds like a long time to get through 200 pages, but it takes me a while to really read stuff and comprehend it and retain it. So Again, if I can do it, you can do it. And I think that that was part of the author's intent. So just taking a step back from the text, when I read the name Raymond Coppinger, it rang a bell to me because when I read the book Coyote America two years ago, or last year, his name came up. So Raymond Coppinger and his wife, Lorna, they ran a program called the Livestock Guardian Dog Project at Hampshire College in Amherst, Mass., This program imported dogs from Italy, Turkey, and Yugoslavia, bred the dogs in an effort to investigate the behavior of these dogs in an effort to help farmers and ranchers ward off coyotes, wolves, and other predators. So in the book Coyote America, we saw that the U.S. government went through a giant effort to eradicate these predators using poisons, and people like Coppinger tried to create a program where they could provide evidence to argue that, okay, we can use these livestock guardian dogs to help farmers and ranchers so that we don't have to use poisons, which are bad in about every way, to protect these flocks. And they had an extensive program at Hampshire College breeding these dogs and um, socializing them, training them to protect the sheep and ward off the predators, which is uh, quite a process. This program also helped to popularize the Anatolian shepherd breed here in the United States. So kind of piggybacking off of this study, off of this project, the first part of the book really focuses on a dog's predatory sequence. So And it talks about dogs and like big cats. And the predatory sequence is eye, stalk, chase, grab, kill, dissect, and consume. So the book argues that every predator has this sequence that they have to go through in order to 
successfully obtain their food source. And the book goes through how different dog breeds express different parts of this predatory sequence. And if you want examples, please read the book. So if what I just said interests you, you definitely want to read the book so that you can better understand these different breeds and how they work through that predatory sequence. The book also explains that different dog breeds display different behaviors, and that can be a challenge as we are trying to make assumptions about dogs and dog behavior, right? So it's important to recognize that breed is going to play into the way that a dog behaves. It's something that is brought up in the book multiple times throughout the chapters and also at the very end in the author's last words. So I thought that that was an important thing just to note. One of the most interesting parts of the book was actually a graph that I found on page 52. And basically what scientists did were to measure the levels of dopamine present in two parts of the brain for five different breeds of dogs. So we recognize dopamine as a hormone of kind of pleasure, of anticipating pleasure. And if we were to think about dopamine in the context of working with our dog, you know, it's like a biddable dog, a dog that wants to work, a dog that's anticipating the food reward or the toy reward, um, a dog that is very driven. And so the five different breeds that this this study um, worked with were Border Collies, Siberian Huskies, Sarplanenix, Moremas, which are a guardian breed similar to the Great Pyrenees, but a bit smaller, and an Anatolian Shepherd. And when they measured dopamine in two different parts of the brain, they found that the Border Collies, Siberian Huskies, and Sarplanenix had elevated levels of dopamine, with the Border Collies being the highest, right? Which is makes sense if you work with dogs. You under, you're kind of like, okay. The Guardian breeds, the pure Guardian breeds, the Marimas and the Anatolian Shepherds, had very low, if not barely detectable, levels of dopamine. And if we think about this from our own experience, if you're a dog trainer, you know you get an Anatolian shepherd call you up and say, this dog's being stubborn on the leash, you're like, okay. (laughs) Because sometimes when we're working with these guardian breeds, it can be very difficult to motivate the dogs. They don't seem to want to do anything. They don't seem to care about anything. And it can be a challenge if we don't understand their genetics and what is kind of going on in their head. And in this study, we can see, well, not much. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right? I'm sorry. I'm being a little bit sarcastic. That's totally uncalled for, but I couldn't resist. So we have these five dog breeds. We measured their levels of dopamine in a few parts of the brain. The really interesting part of this study was when the study crossbred the different dogs. So they crossbred border collies with Siberian huskies, Siberian husky to sarplanenic, border collie to sarplanenic. And they got very interesting results. So when they crossbreed these dogs that already have elevated levels of dopamine, it's not just that their offspring had elevated levels of dopamine. They had double, if in some cases triple, the levels of dopamine. And as a dog trainer, I was like, holy Moses, because how often do we come across a rescue dog that is a border collie husky mix or a german shepherd husky mix or a lab shepherd mix this happens all the time we get working breeds breed mixes that um you know need need training have some behavioral issues etc and in this study we see that in a very limited scope so we didn't have very much variety in the dog breeds but we see that when dogs breed together it's not just that their level of dopamine so the amount that they anticipate and want pleasure and are willing to work stays the same, it actually increases with these crossbreeding. So I would be very interested to see different studies and read more about this topic because I found that to be, I found that as a dog trainer, just to be super valuable information to know heading into training some of these mixed breed dogs. I thought the book was great at acknowledging different developmental stages of dogs as being nonlinear and very different from one another. 
So beha- the dog's behavior needs to be assessed depending on what developmental stage the dog is in. So we can't make assumptions about behavior across the board. So puppies are going to act very different than adolescent dogs. They're going to act very different than adult dogs. The book also talks about barking, different types of barking, different uh, what the barking means, and motivations for barking for pups versus adult dogs. So as many of us know, dogs bark. Other candidates don't. Why is that the case? The book helps answer some of those questions. As an aside, the book makes some interesting observations about when you restrict a dog or a different candid species. What I mean by that is like you tie a dog out or if you tie a wolf out. Um, If you're interested in working with reactive dogs or you're working with dog behavior, I thought the book made some interesting points about that particular topic. Then we move on to chapter nine. So I had to wait all the way till chapter nine in order to start getting the information I was actually interested in in this book. So again, the preceding chapters definitely offered some new concepts and ideas, some of the topics I was already familiar with, but chapter nine was the reason why the book was recommended in the first place. So Paul recommended the book in the context of this seminar where they we were really focused on developing play and the value of play and how the dog's brain just gets all fired up when they are playing. So The book acknowledges that we don't exactly know the true motivations behind all types of play other than it feels good. The book links that predatory sequence to play and how dogs go through parts of the predatory sequence when they are interacting in this activity. Um, Play is present in both adult and young dogs and in different animal species. The authors argue that play could be a rehearsal but is also self-satisfying. What is play rehearsing for? Well, it play is a way to develop, again, that predatory sequence if the dog ever finds itself in need of actually obtaining food or warding off some sort of a threat. I thought that the author has made some interesting observations and conclusions about the play bow, which is a very um, distinct behavior that dogs display when they're playing with either people or other dogs. It answers questions uh, concerning like, is it an anticipatory move? Is it a mind game? Is it a premeditated move to get a game going? Or does it serve as an interruption because an animal is in conflict about their next move? Is the play bow purely instinctual? So all of these questions really help kind of get us thinking about what's really motivating our dogs during play. And lastly, chapter 10 talks about the brain. It talks about if dogs are mindful Do they process information and plan or are they exclusively instinctive? Do they have consciousness or are they sentient? Which is a very interesting topic. And I think if we view dogs purely as pets, we might go into that like, yes, dogs are absolutely conscious or sentient. If we look at dogs purely from a scientific point of view, we might not come to that conclusion. So some conclusions after reading the book, I think it was a relatively easy read despite the scientific text, and I think that that was on purpose. The book explains some of the biology behind behavior, which is super useful. The authors recognize we are, when we are unsure of the cause of behavior. The authors recognize dogs as a biological organism, but retain the description of dogs, which would align with a pet parent's ethos. And I think the authors speak to kind of a new way of thinking about our dogs, which is joining together these scientific concepts and also recognizing that dogs are man's best friend. They are in our homes. They are part of our lives and our families. So all that to say, those were my conclusions from reading the book. Again, my recommendation is if you're interested in these topics, it's something worth checking out. Um, I got a book from the library. I'm probably going to go ahead and order it from Amazon because I do feel like it's one of those books that I should have on the shelf for reference down the road. If something rings a bell, I want to be able to get to it quickly. And again, if you have connected with any of the ideas in this podcast, either in this episode or in previous episodes, please feel free to like, subscribe, and share the show. And that'll do it. 
I'll see you next time.